Good afternoon. We're going to start a few minutes early. We have a full schedule today, and we want to make sure that our speaker has plenty of time to share um, what he is sharing with us today. So to, first, before we begin, on this day, 2011, anti-government protesters are killed as they seek to oust what Libyan president? That's right. Good job. So it is so good to see each and every one of you today. It's a great day to be a Kiwanian. Kids need Kiwanis, Kiwanis and Kiwanis needs you. So I'm happy to see you here. We have some new members joining today and I'm happy to see everybody online. Please join me in our saying our defining statement. Kiwanis is a global organization of volunteers dedicated to improving the world one child and one community at a time. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Clay, will you lead us um, in song today? Certainly will. How many were here last week? Raise your hand. Okay, all right, just checking. We're going to, in the book, go to page 15, and the song is number 33, America the Beautiful. All right, no laughing. You, you, you got uh, your chance last week. Okay, and the pitch will be, mm, Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountains, majesty, above a fruited plain, America, America, God shed his grace on thee. Nick, will you share our invocation? I'm going to tell you a little story to set up this uh, prayer. Uh, a few years ago, Julie and I were coming back to Raleigh from a conference, a business meeting in Virginia, and I can't really remember now whether we were coming from Williamsburg or Charlottesville, but we were working our way across country on two-lane roads because uh, GPS is the great enemy of a decent trip uh, because it puts you on the most dangerous roads and the more, most boring scenery with everybody else. Anyway, we were coming along angling across Virginia on these two lane roads and we needed a place to stop and there wasn't much of anything. We pulled in this little country church and you know the kind with the pointy windows and white clapboard and the little steeple pointing at the sky. And we pulled under a shade tree and started fixing some peanut butter crackers, cutting some hunks of cheese for lunch. And a lady pulls up to the church and gets out of her car and walks over to us and says, what are y'all doing? And I said, well, <clears throat> we need a place to stop. And this was pretty and it was safe, peaceful and uh, a good shade tree. And I said, y'all done a good job taking care of this place. We're out in the country. and." Uh, and I said, have you thought about putting in a swing set or maybe a, a, a sliding board for the kids? And we chatted along a little bit and she turned to go in the church. I guess it was Saturday afternoon. She was by herself getting the, going to clean up and get it ready for service on Sunday morning. And, uh, and then she turned to us. She says, you know, I think, I think you and angel of the Lord been sent here today. And, uh, and I said, I said ma'am, I know the Lord works in strange and mysterious ways, but I am pretty sure it's much more likely you would be the angel of the Lord, not me. And uh, but so we finished our snacks. She went to church and we got back on the road working our way to Raleigh. And I got to thinking myself, um, you know, what if she is right? Uh, what would I be supposed to do? Or what if I was right when I suggested it was her? What would I be supposed to do uh, on that? So on that note, uh, let us pray. Lord and creator, whether you're around the corner 
or busy creating another galaxy, remind us that we should listen to the people at the table where we're sitting to hear what's behind the words they're saying. We should listen to the lady of the church to hear what's behind the words she's saying. That we should listen to our family, hear the words behind the words they're speaking. And when we are lying awake at three in the morning, worrying about our past mistakes, our present problems, or the diminishing number of days in our future, remind us to listen, listen in the night for the still small voice, tell us how to decide what to do when daybreak comes. And then give us the will and the backbone and the strength to take action. And remind us that every new child born in North Raleigh, every new child born in South Raleigh, every new child born in Haiti or in Palestine or Ukraine or even in Moscow is a fresh challenge and a fresh opportunity given to us to produce people that can straighten out the mess we've made and can address our future one child in one community at a time if we'll just listen. So Lord, thank you for listening to our prayer. Amen. So now we'll um, introduce our guest, Buck. Hey club, I've got Lucy Grice with us here again today. <laughs> Welcome. We are glad to have you with us. This won't work now. Got a membership welfare item in the back? No, just a microphone in the back. I've got, I'm understanding these things now. Well, welcome to everyone. Birthdays are on the board. Please take a look, extend happy birthdays to each of these folks. And um, thank you so much. Anything else? No, that's perfect. Thank you. Now, we had an orientation last night, and it was very exciting. We had five members attend orientation, but we also have several other new members. So while the members who attended orientation will begin to walk to the front of the room, if your sponsor will also join you, come on up here with me on the stage. Um, I want to remind everyone to make sure that we sign the aprons in the back. They are our builder's aprons, and so what we like is every member to sign it to welcome our new members. Um, and so when they go out and serve in the community and at our pancake breakfast, it's a great opportunity to wear your builder's apron. Um, and so um, Bob is a new member, but you'll be inducted next time after you attend orientation. So Bob and Lynn, if you both will stand up real quickly, Lynn. I know you're here. Where's Lynn? There she is. So Bob and Lynn are both new members, and they were not able to make the orientation last night, but as soon as they do, they'll be up here, and we'll induct them as well. Okay. So I will begin. Mary, would you like to introduce Macy sure. Fisher, our new member? It's my pleasure to introduce my friend and coworker, Macy Fisher. She is also an attorney at the Wake County Attorney's Office, and I'm fortunate to get to work with her. And where's Roger? Roger, every day. Uh, Macy is married to Jonathan Fisher, and they have a beautiful daughter named Presley. And fun fact about Macy, not only is she an exceptional attorney and mother, she is an excellent tennis player. Anybody needs a doubles partner, that's your person. Please join me in welcoming Macy. Thank you. Robert, will you introduce Susanna? Yes. I'm pleasure. Susanna Robinson is a Raleigh native um, who uh, exposure to the community uh, began right here with the Girl Scout meetings. She was um, attended Broughton High School and St. Mary's High School 
and graduated from Wake Forest University. She joined her father's financial planning firm, Resource Management, in 1999, and now serves as president of the, that company. Suzanne and her husband, Mark, live in Cary, have four children, and she um, enjoys North Carolina State athletics, hockey, and skiing and hiking and swimming. Welcome, Susanna. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> Macy, would you like to? So Macy is a new member, and she already sponsored her first new member. So Macy, <laughs> please introduce Bill to us. All right, so yes, yeah, somehow I'm a new member, but I also get the honor and privilege to introduce another new member, Bill Burlington, who is a former colleague of mine and a great friend and also a wonderful mentor to me. Um, Bill grew up in California, so originally from California, um, but has been in Raleigh, in the Raleigh area for many, many years. Um, he is retired, but had a distinguished career with the federal government, with the Bureau of Prisons for a very long time. He's an attorney um, and couldn't sit still for long, so then came back to the clerk's office twice for I believe a total of 17 years. Is that right, Bill? Um, and that's where I had the privilege of working with him. Um, he's been married for 53 years to his wife, Kitty, um, and they have two daughters who live here in the area and five grandchildren. Um, in Bill's free time, he is very active in his church. He also volunteers with the First T program and Saving Grace, the dog rescue um, organization in Wake Forest, and he loves to play golf, a big baseball fan, new pickleball fan, woo, and also loves to travel. Heading out to Hawaii next week, right? Wow. So thank you for welcoming me, and I'm happy to welcome Bill. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Macy. And then the, um, the Roger Askey, please come step up beside me. <laughs> this is my better half. Roger, I, I meant to tell you, there was some discussion at the board meeting about your application, but you were approved, so thank you. Um, he's already told me three times, don't you say anything about me. I'm only gonna say, he was born in a Husky. I've known him all my life. Um, he served in the Peace Corps in West Africa from 2003 to 2005. He also works with Macy and Mary, and they have a great time. It's a great group of folks, and we're gonna try and get the rest of them to join our club. Um, he is the incoming chair of the North Carolina Board of Law Examiners, and we have a daughter, Mary Addison, who is a sophomore at Broughton. You forgot first gentleman of Koalas. Oh, <laughs> thank you. So please welcome Roger, thank you. Oh. Yeah, sorry, gotta love, just gotta love, love, love. So one of the best ways to share our passion for Kiwanis and commitment to the community service is to welcome our new members. So I know each of you will do that. You will take time to introduce yourself, get to know them and help them find a place to be involved in the club. And, um, and that will help this become their club as well. So the vision of Kiwanis is to have a positive influence in communities worldwide so that one day all children will wake up in communities that believe in them, nurture them and provide the support they need to survive and thrive. Susanna, Macy, Bill and Roger have indicated a desire to become active members of our club, have been, have been approved by our board of directors as a member and having gone through our club orientation, do you agree to embrace the vision of our club and Kiwanis organization. I do. Would each sponsor please present their new pin on the on our new members? So Macy, you've got a hard one. Okay. I don't know how you're gonna get you Macy's go gotta get to the pin. Roger's afraid I might stick him, and I might. So 
I welcome you all on behalf of the entire membership and the Kiwanis Club of Raleigh. Thank you. I did remind them there is a checklist, and once they complete that, they get to remove that red writing on the new member. So if you see anybody that has that red writing, they have a few things they need to do on the checklist, so they'll get a name <laughs> tag. So thank you. you guys Stacey, can... Mary said she didn't get the checklist. <laughs> I just sent it to her last night, but she did confess that she had not started on it. So you guys have a race, Great. so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you, thank you. I will say that we have two members um, that we know will be inducted next month, as well as a potential two more who one has submitted their application and we'll meet on that at the next board meeting. So we could have four new people up here next month. So if you look around, who's not here? What are your friends would you like to have join our group? Invite them and ask them to join. Okay, who is willing? Oh, you know what? We have new members. So I need two of you to volunteer to greet next week. Um, so you can let me know after the meeting. I always want to remind you to check your weekly up, uh, emails for updates. The Salvation Army volunteer is Friday, February the 24th from 4.30 to 6.30. We have two committed. We would like to have a third person to commit to serve. So please let Cricket, will you raise your hand? Let Cricket know or myself know. We make sure you get signed up on the website. Right now it's Bob Goodell and Courtney. And I think I see Bob. Is Bob here? Yep. So you're set up for February 24th. Perfect. We um, are having our diaper drive in March. Um, this is where we collect diapers for St. Savior Center. We collect diapers or we collect money. We also use gently used books that we will share with the children. So if anyone would like to chair that, please let me know after the meeting. But beginning March, the first weekend in March, we can bring our items to the meeting and we'll make sure they get there afterwards. Save the date for Charter Night. That's April the 28th at the University Club. And our golf tournament is May the 4th. Andy, anything you, yep, Andy's got his hand. Okay, we're good. And now, Buck, would you introduce our speaker for today? Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. And uh, again, in our series of having speakers to maybe share something with you you don't know or to enlighten you about what's going on out in the community, we're proud to have a trial lawyer today who has uh, a lot of experience in the regulatory area. He's practiced before uh, the Court of Appeals, the Supreme Court, and he mainly focuses his practice on government and regulatory issues. Uh, he represents licensees before many occupational and professional licensing boards. He has served as he serves as the legal counsel for the North Carolina Private Protective Services Board the North Carolina Alarm Systems Licensing Board, and the North Carolina Board of Landscape Architects. He is a hearing counsel for the North Carolina Bu uh, Board of Funeral Services and for the North Carolina Veterinary Medicine Board. And I got to know him as legal counsel to the North Carolina Auctioneers Licensing Board, and he's also uh, done the same job for the Barbers Board in North Carolina. Uh, he started his career as a uh, special assistant to Lacey Thornburg, who was the Attorney General. He later became Assistant Attorney General, and in that capacity, he served as, at the, as the attorney to the Alcoholic Beverage Control Board in North Carolina. He has uh, taught at Wake Tech. He has been a professor at the, uh, the Wake Tech uh, School of Auctioneering, which we just started last year. He is an authority on auctioneering, and do take a look at his boots when he comes up here because he got that from the auction profession. Let me introduce Jeff Gray. I'll have to say you all are a fun bunch, a fun, fun bunch. And thank you, Buck. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I know a good number of y'all here, and I think without exception, everybody has said, what in the heck do you know? And well, we'll see how little I know right here in a minute because I'm going to uh, share it with you. Um, I have, as Buck said, I've been doing this for quite some time. It's a very narrow uh, practice area. It is on occupational and professional licensing. Um, you've had a couple of board members here. Buck, for one, is on the auctioneer's licensing board. I understand that Mark Blake, uh, former, pres or former board member and president of the Board of Funeral Services, came and spoke with you. He is a member of one of these boards. 
And many of y'all here hold some type of professional license because I know a lot of you and I know the license you hold. So how many of y'all hold some type of professional license? And that's Dr. Dennis, yeah, room full of it, room full of them. And I knew it would be being here in Raleigh. So that's one I wanted to talk with you a little bit about today. Um, as Buck said, I've been doing this for about 25 years and representing boards. And a couple of years ago, I was approached about writing a law review article on the topic of occupational and professional licensing um, from the side or the viewpoint of a practitioner, of somebody that practiced in the area. There is some academic research out there, but um, not very much, very little. And most of it is on the anti side. So what I wanted to talk with you all about a little bit today is the pro side. And once that law review article was published, I started getting speaking uh, engagements, speaking offers all over the nation. And for the last two years, I've spoken just about everywhere in the nation. But it's good to be back in the South, because when I go up north to speak, typically they have to do the little subtitles like they did on that uh, Honey Boo Boo. You remember Honey Boo Boo? Nobody could understand her. Well, when I go up north, they have to have an interpreter for me with my Southern Mountain accent down here. So at least you all will understand what I'm saying. Filled out a form the other day for the Wake County Bar Association, and they said, tell something about yourself that other people don't know. I wrote, English is my first language. <laughs> but I go up north and people have no clue what I'm saying, none whatsoever. So at least you all will understand me today. But um, I am happy that a couple of people have said that between uh, Mark talking about pre-need and funeral services, and then your last speaker talking about wills, at least I'm gonna be talking about the living today. And, uh, but this article came out in the spring of 2022. Um, it was specifically on occupational and professional licensing, and it was a result of two things. One, the fact that there was no academic research out there on the topic. And number two, my ego is big enough to think that I could write something and be some type of an authority. So I agreed to do the article. Um, it um, started out with kind of giving a little primer on licensing, which from looking at this room, you really don't need that because you hold some type of license. But we're interesting in North Carolina in that we have 56 independent occupational licensing boards in North Carolina. That means they, they are executive branch agencies, but they are not under the governor and they're not under the council of state. Um, they are independent boards. They have appointees from the governor and some of them have from, from the governor and the legislature from the Speaker of the House, the President Pro Tem, Nick Fountain. Uh, represents two of them, at least two between he and Reed, and maybe more Nick, but he represents a couple. As Buck said, I represent four, do hearings for others. But there are 56 in North Carolina, but there are far more outside those 56 that are housed somewhere in some state agencies. Things like your home inspectors, they're under the Department of Insurance, they have a board, but they are not independent. But the independent ones particularly have been under fire across the nation. This has been going on for about two decades, and uh, persons like myself that practice in this area, Nick, others have been watching this trend nationally. And most of it is funded from a single source. It's been funded through the years from the Koch brothers, David and Charles Koch from Wichita, Kansas. You've probably heard of them. David passed away in 2019, but they have put millions of dollars, millions of dollars into opposing occupational licensing in America. Um, it's a laissez-faire type viewpoint that government has no place in commerce, no place in the economic system. It's a free market theory. It is not partisan at all. It's not a partisan viewpoint at all. It is uh, strictly about their philosophy and the philosophy of others that government should not have a place in um, the free market. And they've put money into a variety of organizations around the nations, the Goldwater Institute, the Brookings Institute, um, at George Mason University, they have the Mercatus Institute. Uh, they've funded um, the John Locke Foundation and provided donations to the John Locke Foundation here in North Carolina. And so it has been a concerted effort across the nation. And so for those of us that do, do this for a living and represent these boards, we looked up one day and realized that we were being overrun, that um, the anti-licensing viewpoint in America um, had overtaken us and there was no voice on the other side. 
So a lot of the boards, including my clients and the associations of my boards, and as you know, in America, we have an association for virtually everything out there. So even the associations have associations and the licensing boards have associations and the people that do your examinations have associations of people that do examinations. All these groups were kind of trying to go it alone and no one out there was really speaking for the positive benefits of it. And as I say, that's where my, that's where my ego came in. I thought somebody needs to start talking about the other side of things. And there was just no voice out there whatsoever. It was just the voice um, of all these various institutes. And they were, um, they were very successful in what they're doing. They were being very successful. Uh, one in particular that um, was always challenging uh, for these boards is a call, uh, institute of, an entity called the Institute for Justice, the IFJ. And they started challenging boards around the nation um, and for various reasons. Um, mainly to see if they could get to establish legal precedent that there were, there were various violations, mainly of constitutional provisions in licensing. And they were smart about what they did. This was what was beginning to worry us because they were, they were very successful in what they were doing because they would pick the silly and absurd. So in this room, I'm sure we have doctors, dentists, lawyers, um, land surveyors, engineers, auctioneers, real estate agents, all of these various professions, insurance agents, etc. But what the Institute for Justice started doing is picking the silly and absurd around the nation. Uh, they picked a, um, they started a fight with the funeral board in the state of Louisiana over a group of monks, a monastery that was building caskets and selling caskets. So re they represented these monks after the Board of Funeral Services in Louisiana tried to force them to have a funeral services license to build and sell these caskets. As you can imagine, that got a lot of press. It made them look absurd. They've gone against states that, and yes, believe it or not, some states licensed chimney sweeps, and they started a lawsuit against a state because they were licensing chimney sweeps. In other places, it was African hair braiding and some other, other licensed um, occupations, very few professions, but licensed occupations. And so they would, um, they would bring suits, usually in federal court, to challenge the state's law. So they started with the, what you would consider the marginal type licenses and also the ones that would get them pressed because they were absurd. And that trend started moving. And as I say, it started moving about 15 or 20 years ago. And uh, North Carolina has not been immune from it at all. We've had to deal with it here as well. And um, it caused, a, I, I would say, almost a panic among the licensing boards across the nation. Um, it is not, as I say, it is, it is not political at all. The Obama White House released a white paper from the White House on the topic of occupational and professional licensing in America. Um, the Labor Department under Trump, and Trump spoke of it many times, but he never took any direct activity against it, but his Department of Labor did. Acosta, his Secretary of Labor, spoke about it on a number of occasions, and um, there, there was um, a lot of press in that regard, but he never did anything policy-wise. But within just a few months of Biden coming into office, he said he had instructed the Federal Trade Commission to begin looking at the issue of occupational and professional licensing. So it's not a political issue at all. It is a philosophical issue and is a, a, a philosophical view held by both of your standard or, or traditional political parties, as well as what you would call the Tea Party crowd. You don't hear much out of them anymore. But then the Libertarians, the Libertarians with a capital L as a political party, but the Libertarians with a little L, which is a philosophical view. So it's not a political view at all. It's a philosophical view, a free market philosophical view. And what has supported these uh, has been what they call econometric studies. And uh, the studies that are done and they show that it suppresses wages, that it prevents certain persons from entering into the marketplace, and that it, it, it prevents people from traveling from one state to the other to do a particular profession. So those are econometric studies. And one of the interesting things I found when I started this is that for these econometric studies, all of them came back to 
a single professor at Northwestern University by the name of Morris Klenner. And all of his data was out of the very early 80s and hadn't been updated. And I jokingly say when I speak other places, and I think this is why people appreciate my Southern accents, because I say uh, Morris Clinton reminded me of my grandmother. My brand grandmother could cook a chicken on Sunday and then we'd eat it all week long. She'd just take the same chicken and just serve it over and over and over. And so when I started reading all the Clinton stuff over, over the pandemic, when none of us were in our offices and we had a little bit of extra time on our hands, I started reading it and realized that it was just a giant echo chamber. But all of the data, all the statistics out there all came from a single source, a single person, and they just kept being recycled. So all of these econometric studies are out there and they hold that, you know, that, that, that licensing suppresses wages, et cetera. Well, finally, finally, um, there have been some uh, academic studies. Some of them came, came out about the same time as the article that I published um, that came out that show that the exact opposite is the true, that the exact opposite true, that is, if you have a professional or, or occupational licensing, it actually increases, of course, your income for holding that license as compared to those that do not have a professional occupational licensing. And that makes far better sense, common sense, than the econometric studies that Klinner had, but also that it helps minorities enter into a profession when you have occupational and professional licenses. And some of the things that you hear out there is more than just the econometric studies. It's more than just the study side of things. Uh, some of the things that you may have heard, even in your own profession, if you ho hold the license or occupation, is that it's a union. That's one of the favorite things of the opponents of occupational and professional licensing to say. They call it a union. It's nothing but a union. Well, it's not a union. If you look at the definition under the Department of Labor, a union is an entity that, that comes together in a like profession to advocate for higher wages or benefits, et cetera, for their members. By no means are these unions, because all of these licensing boards exist for a single reason, and that is to determine the qualifications, knowledge, and skills of persons to enter into a profession. They cannot, by law, lobby or advocate for the profession itself. And that's one of the most difficult things that I have had to do as an attorney for these boards through the years is to get the licensees to understand we are not your association or it is not our job to advocate for your profession. Uh, the landscape architects, for instance, um, they have the North, Carolina, uh, the North Carolina chapter of the Society of Landscape Ar Architects but they think that the board's job is to go out here and make sure the city of Raleigh lets landscape architects seal plans for a project, that that's our job. Well, it's not. It's their private association's job. Our job is to make sure that persons who enter in the landscape architect profession have the license, skills, and knowledge to enter into that profession. And another very worthwhile thing is that all of these boards now do in North Carolina is they all require a criminal history check. So you know that somebody that possesses that license does not have a propensity to commit crimes. So by no means are, are these licensing boards a, a union. Um, sometimes they call them guilds, and there is a little hint of a guild in there. And if you're not familiar with the old guild system from England, I mean, at one time, or Europe, not just England, but all of Europe, at one time to enter into profession, you had to study under someone for X amount of time, you're an indentured laborer as a tinsmith or a hat maker or a glove maker or a blacksmith or whatever it was, and it was called the guild system. And then you would join the guild in your community and you would become a tinsmith or a hat maker or whatever. There is a little hint of that still left in it. There's a little bit of hints of that. You still have to work under a surveyor to be a surveyor. You still have to work under a CPA for a certain period of time to be a CPA. And as we all know, doctors, um, you know, we um, doctors have to, you know, have a residency, work under other doctors in a hospital, et cetera. Um, but there's a few hints of that old guild system, but they are not guilds either. But those are two things that are the favorites of the opponents is, is to call us a guild or to call um, occupational licensing, professional licensing is to call it a union. And to me, it's just, it's just cheap 
dog whistling, especially places like the South where unions are looked upon with disfavor. So those are some of the things that we have had to deal with through the years. Now, the interesting thing for North Carolina and for us in this state is we became kind of the tip of the spear by accident for the opponents because in 2015, our North Carolina Dental Board ended up before the United States Supreme Court in a lawsuit from the Federal Trade Commission, and it put us on the map. And in that particular case, the United States Supreme Court held that the North Carolina Board of Dental Examiners and any other boards that were set up the same way were in violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. No one thought it would ever happen. And the attorneys that handled that case here in North Carolina for the dental board, highly skilled in this area. Some of the best attorneys, I would say, not only in North Carolina, but in the United States in the area of occupational professional licensing. Uh, no one ever thought it would happen, but it was one of these cases of bad facts make bad law. And it was a bad set of facts. Uh, but what happened in the dental board case, if you don't remember reading it in the papers, and no reason you would remember it, but the dental board went after these kiosks that are in the malls or in shopping centers that did teeth whitening. If y'all ever remember reading about the teeth whitening cases here in North Carolina, Federal Trade Commission had been looking for somebody that would be willing to fight them. And in California, they'd gone after the optometrists, but the optometrists were smart enough to throw in the towel. But in North Carolina, they fought them, and they fought the FTC all the way up to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, ended up in the U.S. Supreme Court. The bad facts uh, are make bad law because there is a series of cases. It was the, started with a case by the name of Parker v. Brown that said that a state government in its sovereign power cannot violate the antitrust laws. And you see quite often government in, uh, is engaged in things that otherwise would be a violation of the uh, antitrust laws, including um, engaging in activities and allowing others to engage in activities, such as being the sole source of power in your community. That's a monopoly, but it's regulated. How is it regulated? With the Utilities Commission. So if they're having active supervision on it, it doesn't become a monopoly or the government itself doesn't violate antitrust laws. But you had one bad case out of California where California had let their um, retail liquor association set the price of wine and they let a private association set prices and not the government set prices. The government could have set prices. U.S. government does it all the time, especially in the way of agriculture products, but they allowed a private association to do it, which sent the Parker cases off in a skew. And that's what happened to us in the dental board case. They held because that it was an independent board, like I mentioned earlier, and set up independently and did not answer to anyone, did not answer to the governor, et cetera, et cetera, did not answer to anyone in North Carolina that it, that it was a violation of the antitrust laws. Now, the interesting part about that, after all the hand wringing and hair on fire of all these other states and all these other boards, and it was the case after 2015. I didn't even want to tell people when I went to a national conference, I was from North Carolina because they would moan um, because it caused such a hue and cry nationwide for occupational licensing boards. But the interesting thing about it in North Carolina, you know what we've done following that United States Supreme Court case? Nothing, nothing. Uh, Nick and myself and a few other lawyers got together to draft a bill to do some corrective measures. We had it introduced in the legislature, and interestingly enough, I, I find some irony in there. They stripped our bill after it had passed the Senate and used it to repeal the infamous bathroom bill, House Bill 2, if you will remember the so-called bathroom bill where you could only use the bathroom. And now, I find some real irony in that. And um, there's never been a bill since then in our legislature. We're talking about doing another one, but only just to correct some things, but we never fixed it in, this, in North Carolina. But let me tell you why, why? We don't have the problem that the Supreme Court thinks we do in North Carolina, especially among these independent licensing boards for, another, for a number of reasons. And uh, one of those, or some of the, a couple of those are my own view. And that's why I titled it what I did, a private practitioner's perspective, but we do not. Because among these boards in North Carolina, these 56 boards, 
I took a little time along with a friend of mine, Bob Brooks. I don't know if Bob was ever a member, but he was um, the longtime executive director. I thought he was. I thought he was a member of the Qantas Club. Well, um, is Bob up there? Awesome. Bob, Bob helped me put this together. He helped me a lot on this article because he is the dean of this area. But I thought Bob was a member of this at one time. Um, but yeah, Bob helped me put together a list. We came up with 26 reports that these boards have to submit to some entity in North Carolina, whether it's the Department of Commerce, the Department of Labor, Cultural Resources, the governor, the attorney general, the secretary of state, OSMB, the state IT, everybody, plus a couple of more to federal agencies, Department of Commerce, Department of Labor. Unbelievable, 26 reports that these boards have to submit. I'm willing to argue with you more than your average executive branch agency has to submit to anybody. But there are 26 different things that these boards have to, to report. So there is no possible way that somebody can say there is not supervision or oversight of these boards. It is there. That's the number one. That's the number one. These boards are being supervised. The number two is, is and especially for North Carolina, is these boards uphold a long-standing tradition in North Carolina of our state being governed by the people. And then you say, wow, what does that mean? Well, what it means is, is before our governor had the veto, our governor had power because he had over 3,500 appointments to boards and commissions. The people of North Carolina ran North Carolina, and we still do. And you see this constant struggle between the governor and the legislature. The governor and the legislature is bound to determine that the people, meaning the people, the, the elected legislators, are going to run North Carolina. And we've had a long tradition of that. We hated the colonial government. We hated the British crown. It goes back to the earliest days of North Carolina that the people run it. And every one of these boards that I'm talking about is made up of citizens of North Carolina. And one of the theories that I came up with in this thing is what I call the mini cabinet secretary theory. So in this little law review article I keep mentioning, I talk about that every one of these people are just a mini cabinet secretary under the governor that has the authority to administer the law and rules of whatever occupational and professional licensing board that's out there. That we do have supervision, no different than a secretary under the secretary of a cabinet level agency under the governor. It's just the pay is a little different. It's just the pay is a little different. It's hundred dollars a day. So it's just a little different than being a cabinet secretary. But that, and then, so I talk at length about, you know, the, the things in here that give us supervision in North Carolina. The last thing I want to leave you with, and you may be of the ilk, you may be of the, the libertarian ilk, that you think these boards should not exist, but I want you to think a minute for what the world would be like without them, what it would be like without them. Number one, could you, if you're a small business person, afford to vet every plumber, heating contractor, surveyor, engineer, lawyer, whatever it may be that you have out there? Would you have the ability to vet them to make, make sure that they have the knowledge and the skills and the abilities, plus clean criminal history. Many of these boards ask for a um, financial report. You have to have a good credit history. You have to submit a credit uh, report in order to get a license. That they have knowledge, skills, ability, clean criminal record, financial means or whatever to perform whatever service you want them to do at your house, your business, whatever it is. Could you afford to do that? Of course not, it would be cost prohibitive. But you've got a state agency that does not cost you a single dollar, and that's one thing I forgot to mention. Every one of these boards are receipt supported. They do not cost one dime of tax dollars. So could you afford to do that as a business person? And then the next thing as an individual, could you afford to do it? And I have had legislators say, well, Angie's list will, will take the place of that. Angie's list will take the place of that. You buy your place on Angie's list, and every one of those, and they're out there for doctors, dentists, real estate agents, everything, you buy your place on Angie's list. I could go out tomorrow, Nick's board's not looking, but I could go out tomorrow with enough board of money, and I could be the finest plumber in Raleigh. I could have the highest ranking of a plumber in Raleigh with enough money on Angie's list. 
and I know two things. Hot's on the left, cold's on the right, and water runs downhill. That's it. I know nothing else about plumbing. Pardon? Oh, payday is Friday. Is that the third one? I didn't know that. I, I thought I'd get it paid every two weeks. So do you really want that? You know, do you really want that running it? So I just want to leave those thoughts with you. Um, I appreciate Buck giving me the opportunity to kind of share, um, share my thoughts with you about this. And I think we may have some questions. Does here. anybody yeah. have any questions in the back? We have a microphone. Please wait for the microphone. We have two. They'll come right to you. There you go, sir. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I've got a question. Yes, sir. Are there uh, professions that don't have a board that should or and professions that have boards that shouldn't? Yes and yes. I would say those that don't, I would say no. But just about every time the legislature opens up the door, there's some group that's wanting one including oh, at one time examples. palmistry you know what palmistry is they wanted to be licensed you've had some crazy ones out there the basis for all your occupational licensing and as i say i've cut a lot of this short especially the legal part you cannot regulate a profession in the united states in america unless you can show it protects the public health safety and welfare that case was dent versus west virginia 1898 when virginia started licensing for doctors positions so every one of them should be judged by that. I think if they wanted to do something, if our legislature wanted to do something, they ought to do what North Dakota, and the bill's just being introduced there, they're going to send all of theirs back through that process. Um, 1936, U.S. Supreme Court handed out a case in that regard, and North Carolina had to get rid of watchmakers, photographers, and tile contractors because they, they didn't protect the public health, safety, and welfare. Obviously, photography doesn't protect it. You didn't have to be licensed to be a photographer. So the answer to that is yes and yes, but that's the standard that you have to apply to all of them. The quick example is, and it's in the article I wrote in a footnote, for six years, three legislative sessions, the irrigation contractors, people that do lawn irrigation, et cetera, wanted to be licensed, and they could not pass muster. Legislative staff said no, they don't protect the public health safety well. But the year of the drought that we had, whatever year that was under Easley, when we had the horrible drought, bam, they got it through under the argument that we cannot afford to lose water from leaky irrigation systems. Hey, Gary, how are Good you? Good to see you again. It's been you, a Gary. long time. It has been a long time. Um, I served on a couple of those boards, yeah. and uh, uh, I think it's important, of course, you know this, but that. Every one of those boards, like on the banking commission and the professional engineer, you had to have people on that board that weren't in that profession. And it gives you, I know what an engineer board, it gave them a different perspective. Sometimes they didn't like it, but it gave them a different perspective. And I think that's important. It is. North Carolina it is. Does that. It is. Thank you, Gary. Yeah, that's why I kept looking at you because I knew you'd served on the engineer's board. But yeah, as you can imagine, to cut this from about an hour to, to 20 minutes, I cut out a lot of little facts like that. But yes, every one of these boards has to have X number of public members on it. And the little problem with the dental board that wasn't a center point on it is, was not a wise move on their part, but they would not let the non-dentists sit on their disciplinary committee. And if I were the Supreme Court or if I were the Federal Trade Commission, that's what I would have smacked them on. But that sort of just kind of, they sort of ignored that one in there. But every one of these boards does have to have private citizens plus licensees, which saves you under an antitrust argument as well. You're absolutely right, Gary. This is such an interesting, um, I've never heard anybody talk about this before. There are two points you made I was just curious about. Number one, um, you were talking about that these boards made it easier for minorities to get in, to, to be in business. I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. And also, in the boards, do you know what kind of makeup um, is it? Are my, minorities represented on the boards? I, uh, so. Very much more so than they used to be. Much more so than they used to be. Um, I'll have to say it started, it started somewhat under McCrory, but with Fever under Cooper to put more minorities, et cetera, on the professions. And now with all this diversity and inclusion trend that we are seeing across the board in America, more and more emphasis on it. Every one of the national conferences I go to, they are talking about diversity in the profession. So yes, absolutely. 
Uh, my own landscape architect board met at A&T the other day because they were trying to push for more. And of course, it's an HBCU. So they're trying to push for more, you know, minorities to come into the landscape architect profession. It's about as, about as white as it gets. I mean, it really does. It's about as white as it gets. Maybe next to only the auctioneers. I think we only had two when I represent the auctioneers licensing board. So yes, there is a big, big push for it. And this is a way that with a license, they immediately have, you know, recognized as being a profession, being skilled, qualified, et cetera. So yes, it, it helps. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks for it. We donate a book to the school system and it has a tag in the front. And if you would just sign well, your I'm name right. there. Great. Thank on behalf. So thank much. you. Thank you for sharing with us. It's good to see everyone. It was a full day. We hope you have we hope you think about what um, you learned today in our program and then think about what Nick said. What are you hear? What are you hearing? What is being said to you and how are you being called to serve? I do have one small thing I should have said earlier, but Casey and Chris White have always and recently in recent years chaired our orientation committee and they do a lot of work to prepare and the slides and they lead it every month. And um, I was able to participate this time and so I just want to thank them. There's a lot of work that goes into that, so thank you. And don't forget next week, Lucy, we want you to come back. We want your application too. So. Um, Please come back and join us. I think I, Jason is also a new member. Have you been inducted yet? Okay, so we'll get Jason up here next time too. We want you to be inducted with everybody else. And then if there's anything I've forgotten, please let me know afterwards. I hope you have a fantastic weekend, and I look forward to seeing you next Friday.